this is something I think whether you're a, a paid lawyer, whether you're you're representing indigent clients, uh, you can relate to the uh, you can relate to the stress and the risk inherent in, in a criminal trial that that isn't present perhaps elsewhere in the legal system, and that is that your client's freedom is always in jeopardy. Uh, that's what's at stake when you go to defend somebody. Um, this can have a, this can really stress people out because that's a lot to have on your shoulders. It's a lot to carry. Um, how do you personally, how have you in the past kept your eye on the prize, so to speak, when even even recognizing that if you lose that case, um, that your client's going to go to jail, and that's quite a that's quite a prospect. If it's all right with you, I'm going to use an example where yeah there were greater things at stake. It was a mm -hmm. capital case that had been through the appellate system, and it was at the writ stage, and uh, some people who knew this fella from Illinois came down looking for a defense lawyer to file a writ of habeas corpus because that was the last stage and then he was going to be executed. And, um, you know, there were a lot of people who said, don't take a capital case like that. It, it's going to, you know, it's going to involve your entire time. It's going to suck all the energy out of your law firm. People are going to be opposed to you taking a death penalty case and et cetera, et cetera. Well, we took it anyway. And when we got into the investigation stage, which is always where you really should start, found out that this guy, in my view, was innocent, okay? His name was Gary Graham, but he went by Shaka Sankofa, which was, in, in his view, what his, his ancestors' names were back before they came to the United States. And um, we fought that all the way to the end. And, and I'll just give you a little, it's not an anecdote in that it's funny, but um, the, uh, the case depended, it, the allegation was, is that somebody came into a grocery store and, uh, followed a, what's, uh, someone who looked like they were wearing expensive clothes out to the parking lot and, ro and, and a robbery went bad. And this per per person shot and killed somebody and they claimed it was our guy. Um, well, as I was saying, you don't do anything until you've got a thorough investigation. And I interviewed the cash cash register uh, uh, woman that was that waited on this guy. Come to find out that on the night of the the, the 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 shooting, she was on duty, and the shooter was was wearing a wildly colored sport jacket that made him stand out. So, and you know, it'd be easier to identify him, right? So nobody had interviewed her. We interviewed the person that, that checked this person out and before he walked out into the into the uh, parking lot. And so we said, can you describe him? And she said, well, he was about five foot four. He was wearing this really snazzy uh, jacket and uh, it, he was really good looking. And I said, is that the man that you waited on and that you saw go out there and shoot that person? Oh, no. No, sir. No, this guy, this guy was five foot four. I think the guy who shot down there was like five, seven or something like that. And I said, how are you so sure that he was five, four? He says, because he was the same height as my boyfriend. I know how tall he is. And, uh, and I said, well, what makes you think that you can recognize the other fella uh, that, that, that got charged? She said, well, Mr. Zimmerman, I don't know you, but I had to tell you, uh, I saw him when he brought his stuff up there, and he was one sweet, Mr. <laughs> he was one sweet package. And I said, so I guess you're pretty sure that that wasn't, he's not the one that fired. Oh, absolutely. We couldn't get it. The case was so far down the line. We couldn't get a hearing on that. And so I was doing everything I could uh, to try to get some post-conviction help. And uh, we got an, actually got an audience with, with the governor's assistant who had the power to uh, you know, delay or even cancel the execution. And so I know that uh, you probably want to hear some failures in, in our career and not all everything was a win. We were unable to get anybody to stay that execution. And uh, that was 
talk about uh, uh, being a disappointment, that's understating it. We knew in our own minds that the, uh, uh, there was a, a, a lawyer and, and an investigator from one of the uh, other organizations, uh, this, you know, the organiz not, not a government agency uh, that and it represented uh, uh, people who were indigent and char in charge with capital crime. Uh, and we could not get anybody to listen to the case. Um, and, you know, we, we put out all of, the, all of that and, uh, and I'll never forget it. I'm, I'm in my office right now. And, and the, the, when I went up there, I, I went up to see him on death row, tell him that we were unable to get any, any assistance for him. <clears throat> but we would not keep, you know, we wouldn't stop, we'd keep trying. And I talked to the warden <clears throat> and he had no authority over it either. And I said, he said, if you want to, I'll give you a call when we hear something back from the Supreme Court. Uh, not, not directly to him, but however he gets it. The Supreme Court still hadn't decided whether they were going to take the issue of stay or not. So um, that phone rang about 6.15 and I'm looking at the door where it was open and it was uh, the warden himself called me tell me they had just gotten word that the stay had been denied and that the execution was gonna take place by six o'clock that night. And I tell you, I lost the secretary over that case because she was so convinced that he was innocent and, he, and we killed him anyway, the government did. And uh, there were people marching in front of our office on the other side that thought we shouldn't have represented him because he was guilty. And uh, so that made you really, have to take a good look at yourself and say, is this what we really want to do when, if you're unsuccessful, this kind of trauma affects your life? And I decided I could do that. My secretary said, came to me the next day and says, I can't go through that again. And so she, she got a job at a civil law firm where all they, are, you know, all they argue about is money, not life and death, like us criminal defense lawyers, prosecutors, and criminal trial judges do. That's a long answer to a short question. It's a powerful answer. Um, I mean, you had to have seen that lady, that cash register at that store when she described this guy. I, had, I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. She said, he was one sweet package. I'll never forget what he looks like. And she was sure that that's the same guy that went out there and shot the deceased in that case. You would have thought that, that something could be done, but we couldn't, even with that, we weren't able to get, it was too far down the road. So we lost, we lost a, a secretary over that case and, and uh, made it tough to keep going for a while. <clears throat>